Our second speaker is Hamish Mackey. Um, Hamish is from Mackey Research and he's going to share his insights into orchard and packhouse risk to pedestrians where vehicles operate. Hamish is a leading New Zealand health and safety researcher with clients including WorkSafe. His research into the Kiwi industry includes suggestions for the industry to consider on how to improve safety for all. Welcome Hamish. Well, tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks for having me here, everyone. Thanks, uh, Angus and Kate, for, for inviting me here to share this, this work with you all. Um, and um, this is just a, a, an interesting sort of project that, um, I guess, an industry scan, I guess is what you would call it, to, to really just sort of look across the different aspects of kiwifruit operations that might be impacting on um, the safety of people uh, using forklifts uh, with pedestrians. So the first thing I want to do is just sort of reinforce that I am not an expert in kiwifruit. You guys are the experts in kiwifruit. Um, I have a sort of a fairly long background in health and safety and human factors. My background is how people work, um, understanding what motivates people, what, in, what influences their behaviour. We do a lot of work with engineers and systems people and that sort of thing, but I'm a people person. Um, and, and, and really the, the main goal of this project was really to sort of, I probably spent about 90% of my time learning from, from you all, um, learning about the, the industry, learning about what works, how things work with, with forklifts and pedestrians. And then I spent about 10% of the project um, writing up some, some things at the end, that, which I just see as observations from my background and my experience, drawing on all the things that you told me and the things that I saw as well. So I see some familiar faces here from these meetings and, um, and, and I just want to thank you all for your participation in this as well. Um, but what I'll talk about is just a, a, a very sort of brief background to I guess why this has come about, um, a bit of background to the problem. A little bit of, if you don't mind, just a little bit of theory. Um, I promise I won't bore you to death, I hope it'll be interesting, but it is quite important because it does set a bit of a context for the approach that I've taken for this and you will see some um, similarities to the I think some of the messages that you've just heard from Fiona. Um, and, then, and then I'll just share basically what I found from this review and then finally there'll be some, um, I guess, sort of recommendations and reflections from, from what we've learned. So I guess to start with, why this project? Why, why did it happen? And I suppose it's probably fair to say that there's sort of an increasing interest in the safety of uh, pedestrians around forklifts and, um, and kiwifruit operations. Um, there have been some incidents in recent times. Um, I, I mean, from my point of view, I do a lot of work in different sectors, including road safety and other places. Um, it doesn't look like it's an enormous issue, but it's certainly something that's of enough of a problem that the industry clearly feels like it wants to do more in the space to, to improve safety uh, around of pedestrians around forklifts. Um, it's also um, a thing that um, government is in increasingly interested in. Um, Trans vehicles and safety is something that's been a bit problematic in the past. Um, it's particularly on roads, it's something that's sort of fallen between the cracks. It's always been seen as sort of a, a road transport or a, you know, an NZTA, Ministry of Transport sort of type issue. And, and it's only really in recent years that we're really starting to see vehicles and the way that we use vehicles actually as a workplace health and safety issue. Um, and so increasing interest is emerging from, from government about how we use vehicles and how we use them in a workplace context. Um, and I think this is just going to grow. And so I think it's really wise, really, for, for the sector to be sort of paying an interest and being quite proactive in this space, which is, is clearly happening and it's great. Um, now this is where we go to our poll, um, our Slido poll. And uh, if we could just switch over, uh, if, I could, if you could get your phones out. And I just uh, ask a question here. So why do people get hurt around forklifts? So thinking of pedestrians around forklifts, why do people get hurt around forklifts? If you could just answer that question there. Cool. It, it looks like the things that you voted on is really about the people and the things that they're doing. So we, I guess I haven't really sort of distinguished between with the forklift driver and the pedestrian. You might have further views on that. Um, but it's clear that, that you sort of see that um, it's about people not really doing what they're meant to be doing. Um, and that's quite a common response in these contexts. You know, uh, in health and safety and in, in, in these areas, we often um, 
think that. We, we think that really, and, and it's understandable, isn't it? Because you know, when things happen, when people are hurt, you've effectively got some machinery, you've got people involved, it's there. What were they actually doing that caused that? And certainly in, in, when we look at road safety, about 90% of all traffic fatalities and serious injuries are caused by human error. So it's understandable that we say, well, really it's about people just not doing what they're meant to be doing. Um, and, and this is really, really where I just want to add a little bit of sort of context, a little bit of theory to sort of how we think about safety and how we think about um, keeping people health, healthy and well. Um, and who's, who here has heard of James Reason's Swiss cheese model? A little bit of theory. Oh, yeah, good, good number of people, probably about half of you. I'll, I'll explain it, just what it is. But basically what it is, this is a, a model that's really been around for some time. It, it helps us to understand... I guess how incidents, how crashes, how serious incidents, accidents sort of actually happen. And it's a little bit of theory. It's been around for a long time. Um, you know, theories are moving on, and I'll introduce them more soon. But this is just one that's been around in the background for quite some time. And basically what it says is that when something happens, when someone's hurt, when there's a crash or an incident, actually what happens is that there's multiple system failures coming together. Um, so people absolutely a part of that and there are things that people do that are part of that and these are the more direct sort of factors it might be the the plant they're using the people the things they're doing that sort of thing um, but then sort of more distal to that there are these things that almost sort of set the canvas for this to happen what was it about the investment in the forklift what was it about the instructions or the training that that person had how much investment in health and safety or the culture of the company was actually there. So these are sort of more latent distal things that sort of set the canvas for, for this and that allows these more immediate things to actually play out or not. So this is sort of applied to, has been used and applied to understanding things like aeroplane crashes and all sorts of different sort of things where people are hurt. Um, and, and more or less, um, it, it's kind of how we understand things actually happening. Now, apologies, I won't give you much more than this. This is probably getting a little bit intense, but just to add a little bit more context to that, um, I just want to introduce a little bit of hierarchy to it as well. And this is sort of Rasmussen's um, model of socio-technical complex systems. And, and that's, that's it. That's as bad as it gets, I promise. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll try and simplify it, and then we'll move on to the practical stuff. But it is important because um, it's about the socio and the technical means that you've simply got people and the way that people are organised, and you've got technical things, equipment, sort of other things going on. And really what it's saying here is that, again, you've got people, of course, um, doing their work at the bottom, getting on with what they're meant to be doing, but that, of course, is influenced by the way that management and the company and, and even sort of regulations and associations organise things at the top. So it's very clear, and it makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got a, a company that takes pride in workers and, and have a tidy workspace and, you know, they invest in safety equipment and, and things like that, then that's going to sort of flow down and people are going to be looked after a bit better. So that's really all it's saying, is that you're getting this sort of downward sort of influence of big decisions that people are making, including investors, like we talked about before, and that ultimately has an impact on the risk and the, the likelihood and, and also the impacts of, of actual incidents happening. Why else do people get hurt? Well, we also know that... Um, there's often a difference between the work as it's actually described. So who know, who's got a job description? Put up your hand if you've got a job description. Good. It's good to have a job description. I think it's generally a legal thing. Um, and, and who would say that the work that they do is really, really close to that job description? And I know we've been filmed, but so we don't need to get into it too much. But sometimes, who, who would say that sometimes the actual tasks and the daily jobs that you do are a little bit different to that job description? Put up your hand. A little bit coy, but that's all right. We get the idea, quite a few people. Um, and, and the point here is that we need to sort of understand how people actually work, what they actually do. So there's often a big, big difference to what's written down on paper and to what people are actually doing. If we followed someone around with a video camera, and sometimes we actually do this, um, we'll see that, oh, that's interesting. Where's that in the job description? Or, or, or the way that they're doing this? Or, or are they doing things the way the procedures and the health and safety manuals actually got it written down? So more and more in health and safety, we're trying to understand how people actually work, what they actually do, as opposed to just what's written down. Um, and, and more positively, I think the, the real important thing, and this is what we're increasingly starting to understand, is 
really most of the time things go right, don't they? Most of the time when you go out there and you do things, there's not people being hurt, there's not people being killed. Actually, there's some pretty smart people who are experienced at their job, who are doing rational things to try and keep themselves safe within a framework, within some rules, within the company, of course. And, and what we need to be doing is tapping into that expertise, tapping into that knowledge of people and understanding what they know about keeping themselves safe as well. So that's just a little bit of theory. And, and, and the reason I pop that up is it just does set the context a little bit for what I want to talk about. But if they can just take away two things, really what I'm boiling all of this down to is that firstly, people get hurt when there's multiple different system things happening. So multiple factors coming together. It, it's not saying that people aren't responsible and they don't have a role to play. Of course they do. But there's always different things happening. And the other thing is that workers at all levels, whether it's a CEO, whether it's someone who's actually um, picking fruit, um, actually has a really, really important role to play. And they actually know quite a lot about what goes right and what goes wrong. So, um, sorry, this bit's a bit small, but, but basically um, just to sort of introduce the, the project, the thing that I actually did here was really it was an industry scan. Um, I visited um, eight different sites. Uh, different kiwi fruit operations, a couple of harvest operations, but mostly post-harvest operations. So I looked at lots of different pack houses, and that was really interesting, and 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 talked with lots of people. So it's really just observing what goes on and talking with people, um, health and safety managers, um, senior managers, workers, just to really get a feel for how things work, particularly focusing on forklifts and in the pedestrians around them. Um, and, and just, just to give a little, little bit more sort of professional whakapapa, if, if I may, and, and I've already sort of mentioned it, but really what's really important in this sort of work that I do is, is this idea of getting data, understanding how things work, understanding how people work. So that's why I spent a lot of time really just listening to people, looking at things and understanding what happens, and just using that sort of knowledge and these frameworks to then apply it to this different context, apply it to your expertise, just to come up with a few things that we might sort of look at going forwards. I'll just, um, human factors and ergonomics is, is a thing. It's about people and how they work within systems and, and environments sort of around them. And that's the, the sort of, I guess, the background that I come from. So this therefore explains the framework that I've taken to this thing. This is how I've actually gone about looking at, at, at this particular issue of forklifts and pedestrians. So I've actually started at the top with, with company culture, with, um, with you know, some of the, um, the policies and the upstream, the supply chain factors that, that sort of shape, I suppose, that, that, that picture of, of working with kiwi fruit, with forklifts and pedestrians. Then I get down and become a bit more specific. So I start looking at the actual work patterns, the layout and the, you know, the, the way that forklifts actually move around and some of the traffic management stuff that you've got going on. Um, and you know, of course, the vehicles themselves is an important part of the of the whole mix. And then finally, I'm looking at the pedestrians and the forklift drivers themselves, and all the things that that they've got going on that motivates their activities. And of course, these things come together to give some sort of overall likelihood and and risk of some sort of event happening or not. So if we just start at the top, then, and we just go through that, that, and I'm just going to go through really just in a fairly pictorial way to explain really just a, a bunch of things that I found using that framework. And this is for my benefit as much as anything. I'm sort of talking myself back through how the industry actually works. You know, you guys know this. This is, this is something that you guys know very well. But of course, you have this harvest time, um, you know, and you've got this. It's not like a lot of different um, industries and businesses where you've got this work that just happens all year. You've got different work that happens. And at, and at a certain time, you've got the harvest and this huge wave of kiwi fruit um, gets picked, comes from the orchard via forklifts and trucks, turns up at the pack house. Again, with um, trucks and forklifts in reverse this time. A whole lot of forklifts run around doing various jobs to, this is how I saw it. <laughs> um, you know, doing all sorts of random things that I think, well, how is this organized? It's crazy, there's boxes, there's forklifts, there's people everywhere. I'm sure someone's thought this out. And, and then at some point, someone actually thought, oh, look, here's a traffic management plan for actually how the whole thing's laid out. I thought, oh, it is worked out, brilliant. Um, but anyway, that all gets done. There's lots of things happening, busy, busy, busy. Uh, processing, packing, cool store, all that sort of thing. And ultimately, you've got back onto the trucks and these neat little zestry packages off to the ships and make lots of money overseas, and as well as the domestic stuff as well. So I hope that's a sort of a decent sort of breakdown of basically how the, the supply chain of the fruit from those vines 
getting off overseas on the ship basically works. And, and do someone you know, yell out if there's something important that I've missed here. Um, but what I saw um, to start with when going around and, and talking with people, you know, the first thing I was interested in really was just what, what is it about the culture and the way that these, these pack houses and people organise themselves to actually ultimately look after the safety of people using forklifts and, and the pedestrians around them. And I think one thing that was very encouraging for me was that, um, you know, in having a chat with some of the workers at some of these places, you know, some really knowledgeable people um, who know a lot about the systems and had some really good insights into what things were being done in their little part of the business to actually keep people safe. And they, you know, they even openly talked about incidences that had happened and the things that were then doing to sort of learn from those incidents. So to me, that showed a certain level of maturity um, in, in some of these situations, which I think is very encouraging. There's also some sort of really encouraging alignment of certain things. You know, when you go and you see a forklift operating pretty much at every single pack house, you see sort of blue lights on the back and, you know, I guess now a fairly standard sort of safety feature on forklifts. Um, you see traffic management pretty much at every pack house. So great, you know, there's a level of cooperation and consistency going on, which is fantastic. Um, and, but also what I did see was, was a little bit of sort of inconsistency in some of those things across the different pack houses as well. What I also saw was this issue of overlapping duties, which you know is a really, really big thing, it seems here, because just like I showed in that previous slide, you've got different people from different businesses coming onto the site all the time, whether it's trucks, visitors, seasonal workers, that sort of thing, and, and their understanding and their compliance with the particular health and safety procedures at any one site then becomes you know, a question. And if we start looking at the environment that people work in, um, you can see that there's, and you know, luckily I got to see a small pack house. So I started off with some of the big names, and that was great to see these massive, very, very impressive um, operations going on. Um, but also I got to finally see a small pack house, and that was fantastic because, boy, that was really different. You know, there's a huge variation in the systems that are set up if you look at, a, at one of the big players as opposed to one of the smaller pack houses. And that's really important because how do we get consistency across the industry? Um, and obviously, when you've got that harbour situation, you know, there's a, a bit less chance for control, things like traffic management procedures and all that kind of thing, compared to the post-harvest pack house where there's, you know, lots of opportunity for laying things out neatly and arranging how people do their work. Um, but, but I guess, you know, it seems to me that one of the, one of the I, guess, I guess, the nub of the issue, and we look at some of the incidents and the near misses and things that have been reported so far, um, you know, it seems like there's been a fantastic job done to have forklift-only areas. There's been a, a great job to have sort of pedestrian-only areas. And inevitably, we've still got all these places where pedestrians and forklifts have to, because the way things are arranged, have to still interact with each other. And, you know, and I don't know enough really about the, you know, the why and the how and how that's designed and all that sort of thing. But it seems to me you do have these specific situations in pretty much every single pack house which still needs continuing effort to reflect on how these incidents are happening um, and the things that can be done to sort of mitigate those, those situations. Now, this will be bread and butter for, for most of you here. You'll, this is health and safety kind of 101, and it's really just sort of reinforcing that. Um, another really encouraging thing that I saw is that you can see there's this culture within the industry of trying to sort of push upwards, point, trying to get upwards on the, on the ladder here and looking at elimination and substitution as more of a, 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 you know, an approach. So trying to make sure that you know, there is no possibility for the pedestrian and the forklift to have a, a problem because they've actually been separated. That risk has been removed. So you know, overall, you can see that that intent is there, and that's really, really positive. Again, there's inconsistencies. There's, um, you know, and at some, sometimes it might be that people sort of fall back and think you know, a bit more about um, PPE and things like that. Uh, when, when you've got some of these problematic situations, but by and large, you can see there's at least an intent to try and push up, you know, and, and really manage those risks by trying to eliminate them, which is encouraging. Um, I think traffic management is something that's worth pausing on just a little bit and having a bit of a, a chat about. Um, again, you know, great to see that traffic management is something that is pretty much adopted um, at all places. And just in case you're not sure, um, what we mean is the way in which traffic is you know, organised on, on a workplace, um, and that's through sort of operating procedures, but but also importantly how it's designed through 
through um, the different markings and rules and, and ways that people are meant to interact. One thing I noticed um, was a little bit of inconsistency in traffic management at the different pack houses. So, and this is just one example out of the different things that I saw. You know, and this is just a very, very simple example. And it's just that um, when you have a pedestrian crossing, a zebra crossing here, and it's just a very simple thing, but it's, you can see here that it's white. And when you come up here, the question is, what do you do when you get there? So what's, what's the, who, who can tell me what the correct procedure is there as a pedestrian walking up there and wondering what to do next? Does anyone know? <laughs> <laughs> who gives way? Okay, I'll make it a bit easier. Put your hand up if you think it's the forklift's job to give way. Okay, put your hand up if you think it's the pedestrian's job to give way. Cool. There's an industry norm, clearly, that, that the forklift has the right of way. The problem you have um, is that you then sort of finish work, it's been a long shift, you step out onto the street in Tapuki, and you then come across a, sorry, this is not a Tapuki street. Um, this, you then have the zebra crossing. And what happens when you, you leave work and you go along and you, you stand here and you think, who goes way? Who goes way? The, so who has the right of way, the pedestrian or the car? The pedestrian, that's right. And it's just a very, very small thing, but what I'm getting at here is that, and this sort of digs into the psychology part of what I do a little bit, is that people have, you know, are actually fairly simple. Um, you know, we have these things called mental schema in our minds, and basically they're just sort of like automatic scripts, I suppose you would say, um, for instructions for how to do things based on what you see. And we take these cues from the environment and we, we basically compare that with experiences that we've already had. And we say, oh, I know what that thing is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pedestrian crossing. I know what you do at a pedestrian crossing because I've, I've, I've done it about 100 times before. And in actual fact, when you do this enough, it becomes a very automatic. It's called working on autopilot. And most people are actually operating around on autopilot, just working intuitively. They're not actually thinking at all about what they're doing. It's just their, their brain is, in fact, it even goes past the thinking part of your brain and it becomes a very automated thing that happens. You simply go up and intuitively say, I know what to do here. So what I'm getting at here is that the more we can make traffic management consistent, repeatable, intuitive, and, and it makes sense to people, then the more successful it's gonna be in actually getting the behaviors that we want. Um, so by and large, as I said, you know, there's some great traffic management, it seems, at the pack houses. Just a bit of inconsistency that, and it may be that, you know, for one reason or another, you decide that actually the way that is, is the standard that should be followed, and, and that's how we're going to do it across the industry. But it's worth thinking about just those principles, consistency, sort of repeatability and understandability, um, and just how sort of intuitive it is for people. Um, because one thing we did see, just going around there, there, was, there were clearly examples, and I think some places had done little kind of studies themselves to understand how much people were actually complying with this traffic management. And it is pretty clear that um, in a lot of cases, people are not always complying with traffic management. And this is because people are people. They'll, you know, they do a little bit differently to how it's designed. Um, but if the more we can make things intuitive and understandable and things that just make sense for people, the more compliance we'll actually have with that traffic management. Okay, moving on to the vehicles um, themselves. This is the forklifts, of course, the subject of the whole thing. Um, and what struck me, and again, I'm no sort of vehicle forklift expert. It's been great to catch up with Mark and sort of others before the presentation who know a lot more about forklifts. Um, but I have learned a lot, um, and what seems clear to me is that there's a bit of a wave sort of sort of coming at the moment. There's a huge amount of interest in safety features on forklifts. It seems sort of happening right now, um, and perhaps it's a, as a result of some of these incidents. But what seems to be, <coughs> excuse me, encouraging is that some of these sort of engineering controls on the forklifts are, you know, are being taken quite seriously by a good number of people. It's, I think the only thing to say is that, you know, they shouldn't necessarily be seen as the, the ultimate answer to some of these solutions. You know, it's better if we work up and think about where the pedestrians and the forklifts need to be in the same place at the same time at all. But at the same time, if we're going to work across the system, we want to have safe forklifts. So there's some very promising technologies, it seems, that are out there that people are already looking at, that are being developed, um, that I think are, are really going to be helpful in terms of the situations where you simply, for one reason or another, just either because it's the short term or because of some operational constraint, you just can't have that separation. 
Um, oh, sorry, just one other thing is, um, and this is just sort of the, the more ergonomic side of things in me, and, and again, it shows my lack of understanding of forklifts and how they're designed, but at some point in time, there's got to be surely a way that we can have people not turning around twisting for half of their day as they drive around on a vehicle. <laughs> I know it's a safe way to drive a forklift, but um, you know, the long term has to be people operating a vehicle in a reasonably neutral position just because of um, you know, what we know about backs and necks and things and shoulders um, when people spend too much time in these twisted positions. Um, and, and just some really pragmatic stuff, which I thought was great, you know, people making decisions about, you know, and this, this came through at least two or three different sites where people are just using just bigger vehicles, you know, bigger loaders, because we can minimise the number of times a, you know, a forklift does its trip if we just have a bigger loader. And, and you know, it's probably got productivity benefits, it's, it's got safety benefits by having less exposure of people to forklifts. So, you know, just some really pragmatic vehicle choice decisions coming through, which I thought was quite encouraging. So finally, we get to the, the drivers and pedestrians. Um, and, you know, talking to people, the things that you all told me and the things that I saw, here are a bunch of things that, that really sort of stood out. Um, and I've sort of broken it into the driver side of things, the forklift driver and the pedestrian side of things. One thing that seems to come through very, very clearly is that everyone is tampering with the speed limits on the, on the forklifts. Now, not everyone, of course, but, but that's quite a common thing that's happening. And my question to you is, why is everyone tampering with the speed limits? So does anyone know? I know it's a bit of a tricky kind of a thing, but what would be the motivation that someone might want to be tampering with speed limiters on, on the forklifts? Sorry? So they go faster, exactly. Why do they want to go faster? Productivity. Productivity? Yeah. So it gets the job done quicker? Exactly. And so is it that the productivity of the, the vehicle at the 30 kilometres an hour, which it's been set at, whatever, is inadequate for the task that that person's been given? <coughs> or is it that in order for that person to do their job effectively or to meet their requirements, or at least in their own mind to meet their requirements, and I think that's a really important point as well, that they have to actually go beyond that 30 k's an hour in order to meet their KPIs or their productivity. Does anyone know? It gets into tricky territory once you start doing that. But the point really here is that it's really important to ask why. And this is a really important sort of concept in the world that I work in is that you, firstly what we need to do is see and learn, but then ask why. Why, 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 why is that happening? And ultimately we need to have this tricky conversation about people's productivity and what's driving them to make the decisions that they're actually making. I mean, we can say, you know, don't, don't tamper with the forklifts, and absolutely, that perhaps should be just a blanket rule. You shouldn't go tampering with the vehicles, right? Um, but um, it's really, we need to need to understand why this is actually happening and what the drivers are, what the, the messages, the KPIs, and everything else that's happening that causes people to do that. There should be like an industry sort of wide agreed, um, you know, standard for, for, for for industry, sorry, for forklift speed, for example, based on expected productivity, and that should be worked out at an industry level about what's appropriate, not at an individual level. Um, just some other things that come through. Um, we, uh, some of these we've already talked about. Um, fatigue is obviously a big one, and you, you know, again, I learned that people have done some great things to try and reduce the the shift lengths that people are working on in some cases, which is great. Understanding that you can't have people doing 12-hour days every day all through the harvest and expecting them to not end up making errors and mistakes and things like that. Um, but an interesting thing with the fatigue is that, you know, some people also told me that it's not the amount of work that's coming through, because if that's set up right, that, you know, people get into a rhythm, they said this idea that, you know, even when it's busy, you're in this rhythm, people are happy, they're, you know, the fruit's coming through, it's pretty good. It's the inconsistencies, it's the, it's the deviations from normal which really upsets the apple cart, so to speak. It's when five trucks suddenly turn up from a, an orchard onto the, the pack house, unexpected, and suddenly the forklift drivers are going, zzz, you know, going nuts, trying to, trying to clear all this fruit. Um, it could be that someone's sick. So, and, and there's these little teams that work pretty well together, and, and suddenly you've got you know, James instead of Bob on the forklift, and he's not quite linked into that team and how they work. So I think a really important thing that came through for me are these sort of deviations from normal, um, which can be sort of precursors to, to things happening. 
I mean, all the random people that you have coming onto your site is clearly an issue, right? You've got visitors looking for work, and someone said that, you know, people walk up and into these no-go areas, you know, from Germany and other places when, not at the moment, but, um, you know, looking for work, and they perhaps don't know where the visitor's office or where they go and, you know, register for work and that sort of thing. So a whole other visitors, you know, a whole bunch of different people entering the site. So I think part of the forklift problem is, is actually just managing how people actually access the site, how intuitive it is for people, um, and what the rules are around that stuff as well. Some of that stuff, other stuff's pretty obvious, I think. It seems that some of these incidents in particular are happening when people are managing bins and bin cards and things. So, you know, this is a real sort of hot time when some of these incidents are, are clearly happening. Um, and I won't dwell on this too much, but I just really want to sort of repeat this idea that you know, we need to understand what's motivating people, why people are acting the way they are. If something's just a, a little sort of slip, you know, oh, I just did, didn't do it quite right. I know how to do it. I just didn't do it quite right. There was one situation where some poor chap um, pulled the lever wrong in his forklift and the forklift type, um, tipped over. So that was just a, a slip in judgment. Um, and the question is, why would that have happened? Um, was it about fatigue? Was it that he used another forklift with a lever in a different place? You know, before that, what was going on there? So, again, digging into the why. Um, you know, if it's a mistake, you know, people actually simply don't know what to do in a certain situation. Well, perhaps it's a training issue that needs to be looked at. Um, and in violations, it's not always about people just being belligerent and, you know, a little bit facetious. Um, sometimes it's actually people. Um, you know, actually taking sort of well-meaning shortcuts around the design of the system that's there. And it's not to say that, you know, we need to have HR measures and we need to have, um, you know, a punitive things in place when it makes sense, but it's really important to understand the context and why people are, are behaving the way that they actually are. So these were my top three, from all of this, these were my top three recommendations um, out of this. And... The first one is, is pretty obvious, really. It's just to go back to those specific situations where you still have the forklifts and the pedestrians mixing. But, but then sort of fundamentally look at the, you know, the physical layout, the time separation, um, the, you know, and, and then looking at some of the technological things on the forklifts themselves to see how those risks can continue to be managed. I mean, this is just an incremental, systematic thing that obviously needs to happen next. It's not rocket science. I believe an industry near-miss reporting system would be really useful. Um, it's been really useful in other industries, um, and I just think you learn so much more if you can have a culture of people getting incidents like this and actually just putting them out there and saying, this is what happened, this is where it was, this is who was involved, you know, in a very kind of no-blame sort of situation. And if you can achieve that, um, and the reason is, is because there's so many more of these that happen than the actual crashes themselves. You know, if, if you think about the, the incidents that are actually reported for forklifts and pedestrians, there's actually relatively few. But there's probably a huge thing of near misses that you guys are seeing almost every day uh, where you think, look at it and go, oh, that wasn't very good. Um, they're the things that you really want to know about. So if that could be set up, and, and um, the experience I have with this is, is more in the, the Log Transport Safety Council where they've got a, a rollover reporting system that they've had set over up. You know, it really is a useful way to go. Um, and as I've said before, I think the other more practical thing that could happen sort of fairly soon is working on consistency across, across site traffic management. Great that there's WorkSafe guidelines coming out in this space, which will, you know, which I think will help with this. But I do think it's for the industry to um, decide what, what consistency looks like across different operations. And really my last... Um, the, the other recommendation is a broader one, really, and it's about coming back to the issue of maturity and culture uh, uh, sort of across the sector. I mean, I think the fact you've got today happening is a, is a sign of maturing culture. You know, this is a great thing to be doing, and it's saying that you've got the industry coming together and trying to work out problems and get solutions. Um, and I'll just go back to the Log Transport Safety Council, just because I've had a bit of experience with these guys in the past. But to me, it really does seem like a great way for an industry to cooperate, to get consistency, to get leadership, and to really sort of lift that health and safety culture. So the more that the, I think the Kiwi Fruit Health and Safety Forum can do to sort of have leadership in this area, I think it's going to be really quite positive. Um, and just a quick, um, just to sort of bring it all the way back to the start a little bit, just to sort of say that, you know, this is an area of growing interest. Um, this is another project we're working on with WorkSafe. 
Um, it's looking at the supply chain, how, how vehicle risks are present in all aspects of a particular supply chain. Um, and it's really just to sort of make the point that I think this is going to be an increasing area of interest. And so I think it's, um, it's really, really good that, the, that, the, um, that you guys are really starting to look at this and take it quite seriously. Um, so just to leave you with three key points as takeaways for, for this. Firstly, how do people really work? So, so what's really going on that site? What can we do to understand people's motivations, their actions, um, understand what's happening and work with them on things? Um, how does pressure flow through the supply chain? How are these waves, this sort of, you know, almost like a wave flowing through, isn't it? But for you guys, it's fruit. It's whole waves of kiwi fruit actually sort of going through the supply chain. But how is that pressure felt by different people at different times along that supply chain? Because you do certainly see the forklift drivers feeling that pressure at different times in that. And, and then lastly, as I've said, what, what does a mature health and safety culture look like for, uh, for the kiwi fruit sector? Thank you.